Number six, and while he works on that, uh, let's read this together. The Bible said in Psalm 85 and verse number six, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Let's pray together. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your word would penetrate our hearts today, not just our ears, Father, but may the good word of God go deep down in our hearts. And I pray that you give us understanding, give us wisdom today. Father, pick up those that are fallen, Lord, and help those that are hurting today, God. I pray that you'd reclaim the backslider. Lord, I pray if there's one that's lost, that they would come to faith in Christ today. And Father, I pray that everything that's done this Sunday school hour would bring you honor, bring you glory, Father. Help people to think today and to process what's being taught. It's very important for our church and for our own personal understanding, God. And so I pray that you'd work in our midst now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, I'm going to be uh, talking about some things this morning. We're going to obviously preach uh, very much an expository Bible message as we get later on into the morning service. But this morning, I'm going to try to just talk to you for a while and try to teach you some things. Obviously, we've been in the midst, if I could get this and this, we have been in the midst of a series on church history. We just basically, a few weeks ago, finished the ancient Baptist heritage. And what we began to do is we began to walk through uh, American Baptist heritage. And uh, what I want to try to bring to you today, let me just move ahead if I may, on this. Last week we talked about the beating of Obadiah Holmes. We talked about the Baptist minister that on the Boston Square had 90 slices put in his body. It was an attempt to kill him. And the whole reason for that, again, was because there was a state church that was set up, and they did not want Baptists to preach the Baptist doctrine, and they wanted everybody to pay the parish state church tax to have their infants compulsory, uh, forced to baptize their infants, and all of that business. So we talked about this. Well, Tim, I don't know. Can you see if you can focus that a little bit better? It's that knob right on the front there. No, you had to slightly move it. I don't know one way or the other. See if that works. And it may not uh, work out. So let's see how that one goes. There we go. That's good right there. Uh, we further then uh, went into talking about Dr. John Clark. And we talked about the Rhode Island Charter. What we basically said was, if you remember this, and we're really talking about the political contributions of the Baptists in America. Okay. No, it's not that. I have no idea what just happened there. Did we just lose electricity? I think no. Okay. Hold on just a second. Are we good? Is there? Okay, let's try this again. No idea? Technology has a mind of its own. Amen? Amen. Uh, basically what we said was that uh, as we looked at our, at our ancient Baptist heritage, we saw the Baptists all the way down through antiquity uh, struggling and fighting for the principles of religious liberty. We then stated that this man, Dr. John Clark, in 1637, as he sailed for the New World, he literally, yes. Your battery is low on your laptop, and that's why it's yeah. shutting off. That's actually on this. That should be plugged in. I have no idea what's going on there. It might be on this. Okay. Because that's not fully plugged in. Aha. Uh -huh. No, you see that? Yep, yeah, Tim. You did it. Power. Yay! How many Baptist preachers does it take to run a projector system? <laughs> I told you that's my mission field projector. <laughs> so what, this is this is rough in it, amen. You may or may not get electricity. We need a guy in the back just cranking something. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll move on. So uh, we talked about Dr. John Clark and him being that that principal, uh, really the bridge from Europe to America, bringing the principal principles of religious liberty, sailing them across the ocean, and then making sure that the Colonial Rhode Island Charter of 1663 had the principles of religious liberty in it. Basically, just to remind you again, Rhode Island was placed on a platform of absolute religious liberty when none of the other colonies were, and the principles that came from this document, written by this Baptist minister, approved by the King of England for them to have a brand new colony here in the New World, those principles made their way into our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, and our Bill of Rights, so that the religious liberty that we hold to today and, and appreciate so much it came to America primarily through this man, Dr. John Clark. So that's where we kind of left off last week. And what we basically said that we were doing was showing the first part of the political contributions of the Baptists. Now, to be sure, there's much greater contributions. I, I shouldn't say greater, but there's a whole lot more that we're going to talk about politically as we begin to get into this. So let's go ahead and move forward if we could. 
I want to jump forward to 17 and 30. You remember we're in the 1660s last week, and basically we said that uh, after John Clark was pastoring there, that first Baptist church in Rhode Island, uh, we also said that then uh, Obadiah Holmes became the pastor. John Clark sailed to England and secured the Rhode Island Charter, which put that on a platform of religious liberty. But I want to go forward to 1730. Some things took place uh, from 1660 all the way up to 1730, and we could just pretty much call it this, a backslidden, cold, dead condition among the Baptists in America. By the way, this was the spiritual condition of all believers in America. And there wasn't much more than Baptists at that time, by the way. Uh, there were the Quakers that were here. There were the Congregationalists at the Congregationalist Puritans and the Anglican Church, and then there were some Catholics uh, scattered here and there. But a lot of what you see today in Protestantism, a lot of these groups didn't exist until the 1800s and 1900s. Most of your cults didn't exist until the 1800s or 1900s. I'm talking about your Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm talking about Mormonism. These things just, there was never even a thought, no idea. You couldn't find them in the Bible. They didn't exist at this time. But America was in trouble, and it really desperately needed revival in 1730. Let me go forward if I may. Why was America a land ripe for revival? America declined spiritually due in part to what was called the halfway covenant. Now the halfway covenant, well, what it basically did was it filled the churches up with people who had never received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Now to be clear, I want everybody that's not saved to walk through this door, amen? I prayed for the morning service for every seat in here to be filled. I'm looking forward to next week when we'll have them hanging in the rafters as we have 16 coming in from Pennsylvania. I want to pack the building out. I want to preach to people that don't know the Lord. The difference was they were making them bona fide members of the church and patting them on the back all the way to hell and saying, hey, everything's okay in your life. You need nothing else. You've come in through the halfway covenant. So the churches were filling up with lost people. Well, how did this work? Well, let me show you this. This antichrist system, and I say antichrist because it's against what the Bible teaches about biblical salvation. Let me just remind you in a nutshell. Here's how it works. People get convicted of their sin. They get drawn by the Holy Spirit and shown that they're sinners. They then repent of their sin, turn to Christ in full faith and repentance, and receive Christ as Savior and Lord. And then upon their uh, salvation, they're commanded to be baptized and to become members of a New Testament scriptural church. Well, they were throwing all of this to the wind. Notice this. This Antichrist system allowed for unregenerate, that's unsaved people, and their infants to become both baptized and members of the Standing Order churches. Now, let me just tell you about 10 days ago, I got a call, and there was a fellow on the phone. He said, hey, I'm so-and-so's godfather. I'm not going to try to hurt you today or, or be mean to you, but I'm just telling you, the whole concept of a godfather comes from Catholicism. And the concept was when they were being criticized for letting infants be sprinkled and poured, even though they were lost and couldn't, were not to the age of volition, they begin to say, okay, you can have a relative who's a member of Catholicism come in and stand in your place and they'll have faith for you. That's your godfather and your godmother. It's completely unscriptural and I can trace you back to the day where it started historically, but it's not found in the Bible. That's a whole other issue. I just want you to understand that and I can give you a lot of information about Catholicism. Most of what they practice is not found in the Bible. I know that because I went to Catholic school, was brought up in it all my life. All my relatives were, my aunts were nuns in the Roman Catholic institution. And so I know a lot of stuff about this, okay? But my point was, I got a call here about 10 days ago. And a man said, I'm a godfather. I just became a godfather. And I want to know if you'd baptize, uh, you know, the little fellow, that my nephew or whatever, uh, so that, you know, he can be, he can go to heaven or whatever. And his, his dad wanted me to find somebody to baptize him. And I said, sir, uh, we don't, we don't, you know, put water on babies because it's not baptism. And I began to explain to him how in Acts chapter 8, verse number 37, they went down into the water. But prior to that, he said, what must, or why, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And the answer was, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. In other words, you have to repent and believe and accept Christ as Savior. And then baptism is a picture. It's a public testimony of what has taken place in your life through salvation. I began to explain this to him. I got about maybe four or five sentences in. He said, oh, it seems I called the wrong place. And I said, well, sir, if you'll just let me take a minute, I'll show you biblically uh, you know, what you need to understand. I'd be happy to meet with you guys and explain this. Open the Word of God and show you it from the Bible, how that Jesus went down into the water and came up out of 
of the water, how that John the Baptist was baptizing adults, and how the Bible teaches that salvation is by faith and not by water. And uh, he, he let me talk for a little while, and then all of a sudden he wasn't on the phone anymore. Why well, text him and said, sir, I love you, I want to help you, and just know that anytime you'd like the information, I want to help you with that. Why is that important? Because you can get baptized in the creek till every catfish knows you by your first name. But until you repent and believe the gospel, you are never going to make it to heaven. Water has never saved anyone. I don't care if you pour them, sprinkle them, dunk them until the bubbles come up. Uh, that is not going to save anybody. It is the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost when God moves into your heart and cleanses you from your sin based solely upon His merits and what His blood did for us. And so, but what they were doing was saying, hey, let's let people come in who are unsaved and let's let them have their uh, infants back Ties. Let's let them all just come in and we'll make them members and we'll tell them everything's okay and the whole crowd dies without Christ and goes to hell. So as you can imagine, the churches so-called, Congregationalist uh, churches, the pure Congregationalist churches, the Anglican churches, they're filling up now with people. None of them have to make a profession. And after a generation or two, now you've got all lost people in the churches. People who are being told something contrary to faith in Jesus Christ. And so what happened was a revival began to ultimately break out. Let me get to this first. Uh, the Baptist Center on the Halfway Covenant has never changed. It was expressed uh, best by men like William Witter who said, The baptism of infants is sinful. He further said, They who stay while a child is baptized do worship the devil. Now you may remember this guy, William Witter. He was the old guy there in Lynn, Massachusetts, where John Clark, John Crandall, Obadiah Holmes went to preach to him. He was going blind and he was an aged man and he knew he wasn't long for this world. Well, remember how when they came into town, the constable saw them going to his house? Well, they were watching William Witter's house because William Witter had firmly preached the Baptist doctrine of salvation by grace through faith and was against this infant baptism. By the way, you can go to Salem, Massachusetts uh, on the northeast suburbs of Boston. You can walk into the court. You can get the records. These statements are actually in the court records because they would arrest this man, take him into court for, for, the, for the blasphemy of being a quote Anabaptist is what they called him and he would make statements like this. He further said, infant baptism is the badge of the whore. Now we, of course, recognize Revelation 17 revealing the mother of harlots as Roman Catholicism. The city that sits on heaven, seven hills, sits on many waters, drunken with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, the burning of candles, the vestments, the, all of the things that we see there, the golden cup full of uh, filthiness and fornication abominations. We identify that. And so, by the way, that's what Baptists have always believed and taught out of Revelation chapter 17. What he was saying was this. Wherever you see people so-called baptizing infants, you can always trace it back to the influence of Catholicism, for they were the first ones that did it. It spread from there into various places. So these were this was the sentiment of the Baptists when they saw these churches filling up with people who were never saved by the grace of God. The Baptists, though, were having spiritual problems themselves. Calvinism was spreading like wildfire. So an inbred hyper-Calvinism began to come into the Baptist churches in the 1700s, in the 1600s, by the way, into the 1700s. Now, Calvinism, in just in a nutshell, is this idea that God created all men, but some people can be saved and some people can't be saved. Calvinism is this idea that God has chosen some for eternal hell and there's no way that they could ever be regenerated or saved by the grace of God. And on the other hand, God has chosen some for heaven and no matter what they do, they are the elect and that they will go to heaven and there's no way that they could ever become reprobate or go to hell. And so this is Calvinism, okay? This was spreading in the Baptist churches. Let me just tell you, it killed their zeal. It killed their evangelism because why should I go tell everybody in the world about Jesus if they're already going to go to heaven or go to hell? If God already chose them to one of two places, what point is there me exerting effort and trying to help people to come to Christ? So this is one of the problems of Baptists. By the way, this is a problem Baptists are still having today when they allow this damnable heresy to come into the churches and along with it a replacement theology, a Catholic covenant theology, and uh, those type things. Let me move on. 
laxness was the fare for the day. In other words, there was just an overall deadness in the churches all across America. Somebody said one dead, uh, church was so dead, you could hear a gnat burp in it, amen. It was so quiet, amen. Somebody said the church was as dead as 4 o'clock in the morning, amen. Uh, as, as dry as cracker juice, amen. Uh, the churches were just dead and dry, and the Spirit of God just didn't seem to be working. This was the early 1700s here in colonial America. However, just about that time, the God of heaven began to breathe upon Christians. God began to work in the hearts of the lost. The Great Awakening was an amazing phenomenon. Uh, but, and I want to I make sure that I frame this correctly. The Great Awakening was what some perceive or what some have called the greatest revival in American history. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. It was not the greatest revival in American history. It was most likely the second greatest revival that America has ever seen. The Great Awakening was amazing because it was uh, seemingly spearheaded by men who had some weird theology, amen? And uh, it, was, it was what we would call a Protestant revival. We're going to show you the Great Awakening, and then we're going to compare it and contrast it with what we see depicted on that picture. We'll, we'll get back to that picture next week because there's no way I'm going to be able to give you all of this this morning, but we're going to compare and contrast what does a Protestant revival look like? What does a Biblical Baptist revival look like? And let me just tell you, there's a lot of differences, but one of the main things is simply this, that Baptists are always focused, laser point, on fulfilling the whole Great Commission. I will tell you, if you ask me, why are you a Baptist? Within the top five is because it is my life's purpose to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And not just to win them to Jesus Christ, but to see them follow Christ in scriptural baptism. To see them placed into the membership of a scriptural Baptist church. To see them be taught all things whatsoever he has commanded me. In other words, to disciple them. To bring them to the fullness of the stature of Christ. To see them grow with the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior so that then they can go out and also train others and win others to Christ so that they can go win others to Christ so that they can go win others to Christ but within this process also Baptists are church planters we plant churches. That is what we do. Amen. We go everywhere that we can and winning people's great. But if you have a bunch of people saved and there's no organization and there's no church that rises up out of that so that it may start other churches, we're spinning our wheels and wasting our time. Jesus envisioned, and you say, how do you know this? Well, let's look at how the Apostle Paul interpreted the Great Commission. The Apostle Paul had his charge from God Almighty. He didn't just go to places and preach, but he did organize them. And he organized them into functioning churches. He would train up and place pastors in those churches. He would teach them stout doctrine. Then he would charge others to teach others so that others could learn. This is the Great Commission. The Great Awakening was not at all about the whole Great Commission. It was about getting them saved. Now, can I tell you, there's a big problem with this still today. There's groups that go out, and they knock on doors, and they talk to people in the streets just like us, but their goal is just to get somebody to profess Christ. It's not my goal to get people to profess Christ. It's my goal for people, for God to use me as a conduit, that the Holy Spirit may draw them so that when I'm done and God's done, they possess Jesus Christ. Amen? It's not good enough just to get people to say, I'm receiving Jesus. I fall. Well, let's see. The proof's in the pudding, friend. Bring there for, uh, for fruit, meat for repentance. Amen? Show me this. And then after you're saved by the grace of God, it's, you don't just leave a baby lying there on the doorstep. Amen? It's your responsibility now because this is not the end of the process. Salvation is the beginning of the process. You train them. You teach them to follow Christ. They commanded them in the book of Acts to be baptized. You must be scripturally baptized to show forth your salvation. Then you're supposed to tell everyone about it. Then you become a member of the church and then you find your gifts in the church and God uses you and you have a fruitful Christian life. The Great Awakening was more about a bunch of people getting saved whereas the Baptist Revival which we'll talk about next week and the following week was about the whole Great Commission. And I think you'll see some startling differences but let's first talk about the Great Awakening because it was a Great Awakening and there is no doubt. We've already set the stage of what, was, what America was like in the 1730s. But the Great Awakening began with a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. And uh, Jonathan Edwards, God lit a fire under this standing order New England pastor. In 
other words, he was a, a Puritan pastor, a Congregationalist pastor, and uh, here he was. Uh, but he, well, here's what he decided to do, though, and this is what made the difference. He deviated from what was expected, reading prayers from the common prayer book and, and reading his little sermon as, and he decided to preach and thunder forth, ye must be born again. I've got a sneaking suspicion that Jonathan Edwards was a saved man. Amen? And so imagine this now. You've got all these standing order churches filled up with lost people who came into the halfway covenant, and Jonathan Edwards stands up and preaches, sinners in the hands of an angry God, and preaches teaches the people out over hell on a rotten corn stalk to the point where they literally could look down and think they were seeing the flames of hell licking their feet and ready to receive them. It was amazing. In 1735, he preached that message, by the way, at the parish church in Enfield, Connecticut, as a visiting preacher. The people were so gripped and so astounded, no one took time to come forward and to pray at an altar. They were struck and fell down on their faces and repented and received Christ as Lord. Lord and Savior right there on the spot. Now this is the equivalent. Just imagine for a moment, if I went to the nearest Roman Catholic institution, and I know that the vast majority of them are lost, I'm not going to argue it with you, I grew up in it. I talk to them almost every day of my life. The vast majority of them are believing in a system of works to get them to heaven, which is leading them straight to hell. I was in my pursuit of the seven sacraments. I was there lighting the candles trying to pray people up out of a place that doesn't exist called purgatory. I went through all that mess. You're not going to confuse me on Catholicism. I promise you, the vast majority of them are lost. If I would go down and walk into a Catholic church this morning, say, open your Bible to Luke 16. I'm going to preach on the rich man and Lazarus. And I'm going to show you a man begging for one drop of water as he's down in the pits of hell and now regretting what happened in his life and just begging for someone to go back and warn his family so they also don't go into this place of torment. If I was to preach that, uh, I would hope that there would be a move of God. Either there would be a riot and they'd cast me out or probably there would be a mass uh, uh, conversion and people will get saved. Well, he had the experience where people are getting saved everywhere because he had a captive audience of lost people. Well, this revival, it began to move. Oh my goodness. Brother Tim, what did you do? Amen. Okay, now we're going to settings. Amen. Oh, this happens all the time. Amen. I think I think Reese sabotages things. I can't yeah, 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 yeah. Don't play about me. All right, let's talk about this. Yeah, play about me. What did he preach? He preached the new birth. Amen. And that is our message. Amen. Because except a man be born again, he cannot save the kingdom of God. So message number one is the new birth. And so this was not something that Congregationalists and Puritans were preaching at this time. They certainly were preaching it in the Anglican churches. He preached complete surrender to the Holy Spirit. This fire that we talk about in his service is caught on in at least 20 other standing order churches. And so uh, the Baptists were also at this time beginning to experience a revival in their churches. So that's Jonathan Edwards in a nutshell. Much more we could say about him but I don't want to waste a lot of time there. Let's talk about this guy. The second wave of revival. Reese, quiet please. The second wave of revival begins with this guy, George Whitfield. But you might look at him and say, well, preacher, really? He looks like an Anglican priest. Might be because he was an Anglican priest. What are you talking about? Well, now, let me explain this to you. He became an Anglican priest in 1739. He was ordained in that sense. We'll go back and go slow walk through his history. But by August of that year, he had moved so far away from what Anglicans were teaching and what they expected of him, the Bishop of London actually denounced him and he could no longer be, be admitted to preach in the churches in London, England because he had left Anglicanism. He didn't necessarily know what he was, but he knew that he believed that there had to be what they called at that time experimental religion. In other words, you had to experience God. You had to be uh, born again. You had to have the new birth. It wasn't an intellectual, I'm going to join Catholicism and work my way to heaven through seven sacraments in the flesh. There was something that had to take place on the inside, and that's what George Whitfield was all about. And so, yes, that's his picture uh, when he preached. But notice uh, some things about him. He was born in Gloucester, is the way that's pronounced. Gloucester, England, 1714. He was wicked in his youth, by the way. This goes along with everything that we've talked before. Is it not that God often chooses the basest and the most wicked people to save them by his grace? 
and use them as a shining light. Amen. And this was certain. He bragged about how wicked that he was in his youth prior to his conversion. He attended Oxford University and there he met the Wesley brothers. You may have heard of John and Charles Wesley. Uh, by the way, John Wesley was a national hero in England at one point. In fact, right outside of St. Paul's uh, Catholic Church there, which is the tallest building there in London, England. You're not allowed to build anything that obstructs the view of it. They still hold it very near and dear. Uh, by the way, Wycliffe was tried there and was able to sneak out while the clergy and the priests got into a big fight. He was printing the Bible and he snuck out of there. But right outside of there, there's a big statue of John Wesley. Maybe you've heard of Methodism, the Methodist Church, or uh, Wesleyan Methodism, or the Wesleyan Church. And, and by the way, one of the differences between them and us, one of the major differences, of course, a lot of them have gone so liberal and woke now, there's really about a thousand differences. But back when the Methodists actually uh, you know, were preaching the Bible to some degree, they've always believed in Wesleyanism that you could lose your salvation uh, and so forth. Forth. But, but nonetheless, uh, he met these guys, John and Charles Wesley, and he joined the Holy Club. Now, the Holy Club was a club for people who wanted to seek God, wanted to know God, didn't really know how to get to God or really uh, have a relationship with God. And as he did that, Charles Wesley gave him a book. The book was called, listen, The Life of God in the Soul of Man. And he began to realize, wow, everything I'm reading in the Bible verifies what this book is telling me. And he'd go to the Bible and go to the book, and then he'd go to the Bible, and he stayed in the Bible. And this was a months-long process. And finally, when he came out on the other side, after agonizing over his soul for many months, he was soundly converted, realizing that the Holy Spirit of God had to move into his life. God had to save him by his grace. So when he got saved, an amazing thing happened. God set this man on fire to preach the gospel. He began to preach everywhere. And at first, they mocked him because he was a young man when he got converted and set on fire and given the zeal of God. So it was that there were times elderly ladies would say, look at the young kid preacher and look at the child parson up there preaching. And they mock him. But listen, they weren't mocking for very long. Because he preached with a demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God upon his life that was undeniable. Now I will tell you, Whitfield's kind of one of the conundrums in our church history. You say, well, why did God use him? God used him because he was preaching the truth of the gospel. Amen? Right. That, and it was wrong in a lot of other areas. And we're going to try to demonstrate and show some of that. But I will say this, amen. If there's a dog yipping for Jesus, I'll throw him a bone. Amen? I'm right. just glad, praise God, he's telling somebody about Jesus. Now, I'm not going to get down the doghouse and get fleas with them, amen. But I'm thankful for everyone that preaches the gospel. So I can be thankful that Whitfield preached the gospel because when he did, many people got saved by the grace of God. Whitfield's preaching uh, on salvation. Now notice the qualifier. His preaching on salvation, on the subject of being saved, was biblical. That's why God blessed his preaching. He preached, he must be born again. Maybe you hear me. He preached he must be born again. Uh, then he uh, preached it again. Then he preached it again. Then he preached it in the next city. Then he preached it in the morning and in the noontime and in the evening. And he preached it so long and so often and it became such an overwhelming theme of his life and ministry that one day he was asked and it was recorded, Mr. Whitfield, why is it that all you ever preach is you must be born again? To which he sarcastically responded, Sirs, it's because you must be born again. Amen? Amen. I mean, honestly, if to get to heaven and miss hell, you got to be born again, what other reasoning do we need? It's because you got to be born again. Why do you say the things you say, preacher? Because I want you to be saved. I want you to be baptized. I want you to follow Christ. I want you to do everything that God would have for you to do. His preaching was not only biblical, it was anointed. It was said that many wept exceedingly and cried out under the word of God as Whitfield would preach. There was a power upon his preaching. Okay. That's what happens when your thumb gets wet from wiping sweat. Amen? Let's try it this way. His preaching was also pointed and very loud. Now, I like this little thing here because it gives me some amplification. Amen? Whitfield had no such luxury. 
I had one of the privileges of my life. I've done several tours of Boston where I actually conduct the tours, teach church history, teach a history of liberty. And I remember probably about five or six years ago, I was walking down the middle of the park and I was heading towards the, the Bo uh, Boston Commons is what they call it. It's a big grassy area and it kind of tapers up. They've got bridges and trees and water. It's a beautiful area. But uh, as I got there, I stopped the people at the bottom of the hill and I said, I want everybody to just stand here and look up the hill. Trust me, just stay here. And this is part of the tour and I walked up maybe about 75 or 100 feet or 150 feet and I turned around and I started preaching you must be born again the Bible says and I began to preach to them and there's people walking by got to hear the message praise God but I, when they all came up I beckoned them to come up to me I said now I want you to imagine looking at this hillside when there were 30,000 people standing on this hillside back when George Whitfield actually came through and preached right here on the Boston Common when the the population of Boston was only 15,000 at that time. They had estimates of 30 to 35,000 or more people that were standing there listening to Whitfield preach. So Whitfield preached and masses of people came. By the way, that's when, I believe it was Lieutenant Governor, if my mind serves me correct, that followed Whitfield out of the town for 30 miles begging him to come back and to preach again in Boston. And I have to go check my record. I know it was one of the higher ups there in Boston that did that. But nonetheless, he preach loudly with no amplification, no megaphone. He would stand up on something and just preach. In fact, it was testified that he could be heard clearly from a mile away. People could understand his messages. Amen? And you think I preach loud. It was also said that the preaching of Whitfield was very animated. Now picture this. Once he was preaching on the soul of man being tossed on life's troubled seas and he would preach that the devil's just about to smash your bow sinner and drag you down to the lowest of hell. But Jesus wants to throw you a lifeline. But the waves are crashing in and at any moment your vessel will be sunk. All of a sudden the man was so drawn into the words of Whitfield. He was an old retired seaman and he jumps to his feet and says to the lifeboats man, to the lifeboats. He actually felt like he was there on the ship. That was the captivating power of God upon the preaching of George Whitfield. And so his preaching on salvation, I have no complaints whatsoever. I can thank God for it. Amen? Amen. Whitfield finally comes to America. Whitfield preached in many places, by the way, I haven't mentioned. Uh, some of these places were Scotland. By the way, Great Revival broke out. Wales, Ireland, England, Bermuda, Portugal, and everywhere that Whitfield preached, it seemed the revival broke out. He also preached in America. He took a total of six trips to America. He preached all over America. And this is what Americans talk about in our history when they talk about the effects of the Great Awakening on America. First, he preached in Philadelphia. It was said that God moved so greatly, the whole city was in an uproar. Can you imagine? Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. I have a nephew that graduated there with a uh, master's degree uh, in engineering. And he, was, he went to Temple. Temple surrounded by three pretty nasty neighborhoods. My brother one time got cut off there, thought he was going to get killed right there in the streets because he accidentally went down a wrong street uh, near the university. And I'm just saying, folks, uh, I would love to see a move like this today right. in Philadelphia. But guess what? Philadelphia was wicked back yonder, too. People were lost and going to hell back yonder. But it flipped the city on its head is what the historians tell us. Hey, okay, let me move on here so I can get this to work. New York. When he went to New York, he was forced by the Anglican Church to preach in the open fields. They pushed him out of the city, and the crowds came and thronged him anyway. Long before there was a Woodstock, amen, there were people standing out in muddy fields listening to George Whitfield preach, amen. I, all right, there we go. Massachusetts, at Jonathan Edwards Church, a congregation it was said was melted by every sermon he preached. Now, if you have ever preached at all, but Tim, you'll be able to uh, at, at, at least relate to this some. Um, think about this. In Connecticut, he preached over 175 times in 75 consecutive days. Now, I don't know if you know what that does to you spiritually, physically, mentally. I will tell you this. On Monday morning, I feel like I'm in a coma. I like to get up about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Mondays just because Sunday drains me. I know I look like I have vim and vigor, but then you go home and it's like, it, you're, it's over. Amen? Well, listen, this guy wasn't preaching. No, you know, I'm doing like, what, maybe a 35, 45-minute Sunday school. I'll preach probably a 45-minute message today. Then I'll bring a little sermonette tonight, right? No, Whitfield was preaching with no 
concept of time. There was no clock in the back. He was thundering forth his voice out over the masses. And he was preaching his heart out and begging and pleading with people full of sweat. Wiping himself down. Helping him to get mounted on a horse to travel maybe 15 or 20 other miles. Get off the horse and do it all over again. And sometimes do this two and three and even four times in a day's time. And to do it day after day after day. He literally became a vessel for God to speak through. And the Lord was mightily blessing. How many like to see Connecticut have revival today? Amen. This is what was going on. These colonies were having great revival uh, in their midst. The Connecticut summary was at least six towns saw a great revival. William Lumpkin, the Baptist historian, said in a brief six-week period, the religious climate of New England was changed. Amen. This, in a nutshell, is why we call it the Great Awakening. God was certainly moving mightily. Whitfield preached all over America. I'll give you this and we'll close this morning because we don't have time. But uh, he had many uh, converts and much success. But such a large number of those saved joined the Baptist churches that he once stated in frustration, all my chickens have turned into ducks. Now, why would he say such a thing? Well, people were getting saved. And praise God, Whitfield was preaching the gospel. If they were there, he was preaching the gospel. They heard it, they'd get converted. But you know what would happen? Then they'd pick up a Bible. And they'd say, okay, wow, why does Mr. Whitfield say this? See, Whitfield still had a lot of the Anglican priest in him. Whitfield still had a lot of bad theology. Again, he was right on salvation. But they would read their Bible and say, you know, the Bible really makes me a Baptist. And they'd go join the Baptist churches. That was one of the things that inspired Mary E. Bamford to write her book ages ago, The Bible Makes Us Baptist. They would pick this up and say, well, I don't align with this with Mr. Whitfield. I align more with the Baptist. And I don't see, I see biblical deep water baptism like the Baptists do it. And so he said this in frustration. Now, I've often said this, this slide, it takes a lot of time to make these. And so I, I really want to show you this one more time, amen. I want to see the animals uh, moving, amen. There you go. Isn't that awesome? Now, why do I want to do that? Why do I want to do that three times, amen? Because there's something to be said for those animals. What are you talking about? Why did he pick these particular animals? And why did he say that he had chickens, whereas when they became Baptists, they turned into ducks? Well, you know, chickens, they like a little bit of water, right? Amen? Brother Chris, you've got chicken problems, amen? I'm not going to bring that out. But uh, him and Brother Tim are out there, man, full guard, mop suits, amen, chemical hats. But uh, anyway, they're trying to wrangle some killer chicken or something, Brother Chris has. But uh, you know chickens. Chickens will drink out of the pond. They'll drink out of the puddle. They'll drink out of a little dish. But ducks, no, 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 no. Ducks love water. Yeah. Ducks swim in water. Ducks live on water. In fact, you know what ducks do that chickens don't do? Ducks fully immerse and go down under the water. Amen? And that is exactly what Winfield was saying in frustration. I've got all these people I'm trying to teach them. You've got to be sprinkled and all of that. And the Bible teaches deep water immersion. Again, for the millionth time, what does that look like? A cross. And this is the water flowing. And this is the man standing in the water. Only this type of baptism pictures the cross. What happens when you go under? It pictures the death and burial of Christ. And when you come back up out of the water, it pictures the resurrection of Christ. And it's a public testimony of you saying, I went down to the cross with Jesus, and my old life is buried and hid with Christ in God. And I've now been raised to walk in newness of life. You can pour, sprinkle, splash, dump, use a garden hose, and it will never picture that in a thousand years. And if it did, Christ still commanded one baptism. Do you know the Greek word baptizo literally means to dunk or to immerse? Somebody said, do you baptize by immersing? Yes, I immerse by immersing. Do you baptize by dunking people? Yes, I'm a dunker because baptism means to immerse. Amen. And so Whitfield was losing them to the Baptist, and we'll have to come back next week. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, bless our uh, time together in the Sunday morning hour. Seal these things to our hearts, and may we learn our heritage, Father, understand our country, and understand the, the plan and plot that you have laid before us. We 